Welcome to chapter 8. Chromosomes, genes, and inheritance. Um, there's going to be quite a few slides in this um, slideshow that are not in your textbook. I'm using them from the Campbell version of the textbook. I think they'll enhance some of the things we'll talk about. And they're just tidbits that I like to include. Maybe some of the figures are, um, in my mind, a little bit more clear and just the way I like to explain things. Uh, but I'm still going to use plenty from your textbook as well. So the image to start out with is to sort of set the stage and remind you that Gregor Mendel was a monk who did his work in the 1860s or so. He lived in Austria. And remind yourself of what that era was like. 1860s in America was the Civil War era. So we don't have the internet. We don't have constant communication. Interestingly, Mendel did his work, um, he's a contemporary of Charles Darwin, but since they didn't live near each other, uh, they probably did not have a lot of opportunities to discuss their ideas with each other. And Mendel did his work in a monastery, it was common for people in religious orders to do some science, and he's had a lot of time on his hands, he grew a lot of pea plants, and one of the things he's most noted for and respected for with his science is that he kept a lot of numbers to back up his ideas. So when we're going to be counting our flies, you'll see how having more flies can help validate your hypotheses, especially if you apply some statistics to them. So we're going to see a lot of numbers when we get through some of these. This is an image of a pea plant. Some of you guys might see them in your gardens as sweet peas or if you grow real peas. They have a, a small flower. And then this is just to remind you about the parts of the flower that are involved in reproduction. We'll be talking about them later on in the year. The female part of the flower is called the carpal. Your textbook has a different word here, pistol, which is old nomenclature, and it's now called the carpal. Pistol's accepted, but I don't use it. Um, the pollen will land on the tip of the carpal. The pollen will go down here and fertilize the eggs in the ovules. The stamen is the male organ where the pollen is made, so you can easily um, pollinate your own flowers. And Mendel took advantage of that. He would remove maybe the stamen from one flower and then be able to transfer, for example, from this white flower, the pollen, and know that he was transferring it to this pure breeding purple flower. And therefore, he could control his fertilizations. Very important when you're trying to do these experiments. Lots of vocab comes up in this um, chapter again, and um, we'll be using them, and I'll be using it when we do examples on the board. So the parental generation is called the P generation. We also, um, my dog in. We also are going to talk about pure breeding populations. Pure breeding populations would be you have two homozygous alleles on a gene on a on chromosomes, so capital P, capital P for a purple flower, and in the case of the white flower, which happens to be recessive, we might use the nomenclature lowercase p, lowercase p. They carry two copies of the same allele, so they are homozygous and true breeding. We'll be using those words as we keep going on. I'll show you more examples. If you cross a true breeding homozygous purple flower with a true breeding homozygous white flower, you get an offspring generation called the first filial generation or the F1 generation. And in this case, we'll explain it more thoroughly in a minute, they're all purple because it inherits one purple gene and one white gene, and purple is dominant to white. Again, all words we're going to talk about. So kind of set the stage again for Mendel, just to give you an idea of the different kinds of traits that he followed. So he called them characters, and um, basically it's there's a dominant trait and a recessive trait. And he chose wisely. He had about seven different traits. They um, were very cut and dried. They were either this or that. So we have purple and white. We have the position of the flower being axial or terminal at the tips. We have seed color being yellow and green seed shape being round and wrinkled, pod shape that encloses those peas is inflated or constricted, pod color could vary in green or yellow, and then we can have tall and dwarf plants. You'll be solving lots of um, problems for prediction in this um, chapter, and you'll see um, several of these characteristics um, as well as some other ones that we can trace. So going back to that nomenclature, we've dropped the term allele. And that basically is, we, we, I referred to them before as flavors. So now we can give it a little bit more permanence. Here's a chromosome. 
You inherit one from mom, you inherit one from dad. These are homologous chromosomes, we're aware of that. At any given position on the chromosome, you might have a gene that codes for something. In this case, this is coding for the pigment purple, and in this case, this gene is coding for the pigment white. So at the same position, or the same locus, we have the flower color gene. This happens to be the purple allele, this happens to be the white allele. The only difference would be in somehow the sequence of the DNA is a little different to make this guy purple, that guy white. So, moving on to some experiments. Um, their book, our book is going to give you um, an example of the round seeds and the wrinkled seeds. And, um, peas, the round is going to be dominant. So we have true breeding, which means that these are homozygous for the round gene and these are homozygous for the wrinkled gene. We cross-pollinate that pea generation to make the offspring and we see that they are all round and then you can plant that offspring and then find out the next generation would be the F2 generation and this is just some data I'm gonna move on to explaining how things go so using their seed for um, oh they're gonna use smooth and wrinkled sorry I said round smooth is a capital S and wrinkled would be a lowercase s. So the F1 generation, F1 generation was smooth, but they were heterozygotes. So heterozygotes mean that you carry both the dominant and the recessive gene. We'll draw these Punnett squares up on the board, but basically if the parents were capital S, capital S, crossed with lowercase, lower, um, lowercase s, lowercase s. The only thing that you could have in the offspring, because the eggs brought little s's, the sperm brought capital S's, would be a mixture of capital S, lowercase s. They all were smooth. If you cross these, and we do that here, you then would have one, one um, eggs having capital S, lowercase s. You can think of these as the gametes egg spring coming to the the meat and then the sperm are the gametes are capital S lowercase s. So now in this next generation, the F2 generation, we will find um, some changes going on. We're going to rediscover the wrinkled seed because now we have a chance of getting two lowercase s's or a homozygous recessive. We're going to have two of them that are heterozygous and we have one that is homozygous. So these all show the dominant trait this is the recessive, the only one that you can see the wrinkled trait. Oh, that's a repeat of the same thing. So Mendel did this, I have it written up here, to describe his first law, or we attribute it as his first law, and it's called independent assortment. And Mendel's first law basically says that genes segregate, or alleles segregate. And we know that because we know that every, um, your copies of your, for example, your mother's chromosomes that you inherited and the dad's chromosomes are going to split in meiosis and go into different haploid gametes and they segregate. Maybe it'd be easier if we look at um, chromosomes in this. So here's a diploid parent. This diploid parent has got one, homos one uh, dominant gene and one um, recessive gene. So this is a heterozygote. And during S phase, we know that those um, chromosomes get copied. So now we have the sister chromatid here, capital S's, and sister chromatid here, lowercase s's. And then they're going to go through meiosis. In the end of meiosis one, the sisters stay together and they're separated like this. And then at the end of meiosis two, we know that all the gametes are going to separate into four haploid gametes, capital S, capital S, lowercase s, lowercase s. So essentially every time you're building a Punnett square, you are setting up um, meiosis and you're setting up your gametes. So what happens if you're given a smooth P? Since smooth is a dominant, you really can't tell if this is a homozygous dominant or a heterozygote. So what you can do is what's called a test cross. And a test cross is always crossing your unknown with the homozygous recessive. So if this guy was capital S, capital S, and he crosses it with this one, the outcome 
is going to be all smooth seeds, going back to that first cross. However, if it was a heterozygote crossed with a homozygous recessive, we're now going to get a 50-50 mix because the eggs from this guy are capital S, lowercase s, whereas the sperm from this guy is all lowercase s. So now we've got capital S, lowercase s, two lowercase s's, same here, and the capital S, lo lowercase s here. So we have a heterozygous and a homozygous recessive mix. So you can tell by doing a test cross what the um, genetics or the genotype is of your um, unknown there. The last idea that I'll talk about in this um, vodcast is the idea of what happens if you have two genes that you're going to follow. So Mendel was pretty lucky. He happened to pick characteristics that or characters that existed on seven different or six different chromosomes. Turns out the pea plants have these genes on all different chromosomes. So he never saw a phenomenon that we're going to talk about with the flies in the next chapter. But he saw all of these genes moving independently. So remember that law of independent assortment that everything lines up on the metaphase plate and can sort its own way independently. That's also what's happening with the chromosomes and Mendel can prove that. So if he takes a homozygous dominant smooth yellow pea and crosses it with a homozygous recessive wrinkled green pea, he gets one kind of pea out. He gets the dominant phenotype. He sees it. That's another vocab word we have to discuss. Phenotype. Capital S, little s, capital Y, little y. That's the only thing he gets. If he crosses these peas by themselves, so we have the heterozygote here and the heterozygote here, we're going to make an F2 generation. Okay. It's a little complicated how you get the gametes on this one. We're going to do it in class a couple times. You have to get good at it. We'll put it on the board. But some of you guys right, re might remember the FOIL method from um, math. First, outside, inside, last. I don't know what that is. Anyway, take that capital S and put it here. And mix it with that first Y, capital Y. <coughs> Excuse me. Then take that capital S here and mix it with the second possible Y. So then you get a capital S lowercase y. Then we move on to the lowercase s. Match that with the capital Y. And then a lowercase s with the lowercase y. <coughs> Do this really big cross and we get a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotype ratio, which we'll talk about more in class. <laughs>